Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal channel. The channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. Wild animals are domestic. If wild, then free living or in captivity. Maybe you are a student of further education or in higher education. On the other hand, maybe you are in mid-career and want a career change that gets you working directly or indirectly in the animal industry. Whatever you want to do in whatever sector of the animal industries, we aim to cover it all. And most weeks we interview an animal industry professional who provides insight into the skills, experiences and personal qualities needed to do what he or she has done successfully to work with animals. My guest today is Simon Tyres. Simon worked as a professional falconer and then as a gun dog trainer. He's just published a book and this is it. The Specialist Falcon, in which he talks about his life, career and methods to get the best out of his trained falcons in the lowlands of the UK. Simon is my next guest and he joins me now. Simon Tyres, author of The Specialist Falcon. Welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Hi John, nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Uh, Simon, please can you begin by describing your career from the beginning to date? Right, um, I'll try and uh, keep it as <laughs> brief as I can because it's been quite a long uh, career. Uh, I started, uh, well, I, I originated from a Nottinghamshire uh, mining town. Um, my father obviously was a miner, a very keen interest in the countryside, brought me up the same. Uh, absolute passion for uh, the natural world, birds in particular, uh, back in those days, which is a long time ago now. Um, yeah, spent a lot of time up the, uh, up the fields, up the woods, um, following my father's shooting, etc doing all sorts of things that we did in those days, egg collecting, which is obviously frowned, <laughs> frowned upon now, but it was what we did in those days to a degree. Um, always got this interest in birds and came along a film in, well, it was released in 1969. I saw it at the end of that year with my mother, a film called Kez, which everybody is familiar with. Uh, again, about a, a lad from a mining town. And that sparked my interest in falconry. It started from there. I started to look into it more. In those days, falconers were few and far between. Very difficult to find anybody that, uh, that was a practicing falconer. But I was very determined, as I, as I still am, when I want to do something, I'll do it. Um, eventually found a local falconer and one or two other guys and started from there. Started with kestrels, which were really all that was available. Um, got involved with a small hawking club at the time called the East Midlands Hawking Club that were at that time importing birds from other countries, lanners, luggers, goshawks, eagles, all sorts of things used to be brought in. So I started getting more and more experience, went through my teens. Um, by then, the hunting passion had really developed uh, and I started flying uh, mainly sparrows at the time because that's what was all that was available. Um, obviously, I uh, only got my pocket money to fund it. Uh, Sparrowhawks were readily available, which is what I took and uh, trained and, and started hunting with. Those and alongside goshawks, which I'd tagged on to a local falconer who specialised in goshawks and hounded him. And he allowed me to manage birds and took me hunting. And it just went from there and all the way through my teens. I had a few falcons, a few different breeds of birds, um, but still retained that. Was still a keen hunter, shooting, fishing ferreting, doing everything that, that you do in the countryside then. Um, different careers, I didn't achieve 
a position that I wanted initially when I left school, which was to either be a, a falconer in the true sense of the word, which those jobs were few and far between, or my second option was a gamekeeper. That didn't come to fruition initially. Um, and then in the early 80s, I saw a position advertised for a chap called John Fairclough, who at the time was the treasurer of the British Falconers Club, and he was advertising for a, a falconer in the true sense of the word, to train birds just for hunting. Nothing else, no display work, uh, nothing else, just training falcons and training dogs to hunt. And out of 57 applicants, I managed to secure the position, much to my surprise. And it went on from there, and that opened up all sorts of doors for my experience. Um, one of the highlights of the time there was every year, two months red grouse hawking in Scotland. Um, we ended up for the last 11 years on a 52,000 acre moor for two months every year hunting grouse, which was phenomenal. Um, I detail it in the book, but it, it, the, the whole um, career was based around training hawks, training falcons. We flew goshawks as well, um, but flying long wings at grouse and then at partridge and pheasants and duck on the lowland. Uh, and living the dream, as it were, uh, which I did that for 18 seasons. Um, through to 2002. Um, midway through my career as falconer, like a lot of these positions, these jobs of, of what you dream of, they're not the best to paid jobs. And unbeknown to me, I was developing a talent for training working dogs. I was just training my own dogs to work with the hawks, the falcons to shoot with or whatever. And people always started commenting on how good my dogs were. So being on such a poor wage, I came up with the idea of selling trained dogs or giving tuition to people to actually teach them to train dogs. And I think at that time, there was literally a handful of professional gun dog trainers. You, um, you've got the likes of Moxon, the Wileys, the Chudleys, there's one or two doing it, but on a very, very few and far between. And I don't think anybody was actually giving tuition, teaching people how to train the dogs. And I came up with this idea and Basically, on the side of doing the, the Falconers position, I, I built a very, very good business. Uh, it went professional in 91 uh, as a company, and that was Hawcroft Gun Dogs. Um, by 2002, as much as I loved the Falconers position I was in, I could see that there was a hugely successful business building, and I took the decision to leave the Falconers position to progress the gun dog business and get me into a, a position which I then put everything into that was highly successful. We specialized mainly in Spaniels, but I've trained every working breed, uh, competed at the top level, made uh, 13 field trial champions up, Springers and uh, Cockers mainly and a few Springers. Um, I've won the Cocker Championship on multiple occasions, particularly 2007 and 2008, back-to-back -back wins with homebred dogs off my Tim's Gary line. Um, the first year making a history by winning it with the youngest ever dog at 19 months old, a dog called Tim's Gary Barlow. We won the following year at Sandringham where by winning it, I was presented with all the prizes by Her Majesty the Queen, which was obviously a great honor. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, the business grew and grew. We did very well out of it, but I always had the ambition to be successful and then get back to serious falconry as soon as I could. Uh, we moved to this property in 2008, and for which my wife runs a very, very high standard luxury boarding kennel, which enabled me to retire five years from professional training and devote my time to maintaining the, the grounds and the facilities where we are, but allowing me to go back to hawking seriously through the season, which I do now, um, hunting 100 plus days of hunting, um, nothing else, like proper true hunting, pheasants and partridge with my team of falcons and my pointers, um, and just living and breathing it. But the difference now, I'm doing it for myself. As much as I enjoy doing it for John Fairclough, it's back to doing it for me. And I have changed my methods to what I used to have to do as an employed falconer. Um, but we're back to doing it my way and just having the best falconry of my life now because I'm in a very fortunate position to, to do it to the full. Um, yeah, very fortunate, very fortunate. That's a short resume. <laughs> it sounds phenomenal. I think you're going to have a very happy retirement, aren't you? Uh, Simon, what are the skills 
experiences and personal qualities that have been key to your success as, first of all, a falconer and then as a gun dog trainer? I think, I mean, both roles work hand in hand. I mean, it's both in, they're both involved with hunting and I am a hunter at heart. Um, on the back of that, I'm a hunter and a conservationist, which some people don't think that can work, but it does work very, very well as, 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 as science has proved nowadays. Um, having a good, first of all, a good sound understanding of the countryside and nature uh, and how it works. That is, that is a key for anybody within any of these types of sports, these hunting roles. You've got, it's not only knowing about hunting, it's knowing where you're hunting and what you're hunting and knowing your quarry and having a sound on the set of everything around you, because that will make you, that will give you better field craft in every, whatever country sport you develop and you go into. Field craft is vitally important. Um, personally, and it can be quite troublesome at times, I set myself massive high standards. I set the bar very, very high, and I'm always looking to, to raise it even further. Um, in the quality of what I do with the gun dogs, it was the quality of the dogs I produce for clients. The success of those dogs in the field they're either in competition or whatever and the same with my falcons i've pushed them to the limit to get the best possible performance it's not all about yes we're hunting but it's not all about it's not about numbers it's about the whole package the performance um quality flying uh suitable for the ground birds in super tip-top condition fit and being allowed to fly as they should um and, and I say, just knowing your surroundings, uh, being very thorough. And I think as well, being able to pass that over. I mean, as, as, a, uh, as a teacher, when I was teaching people to train gun dogs, uh, people went on and were very, very successful. And I think having the ability to put that over to your clients and to people. And like I hope I have done with the book as well, the reviews I'm getting, that, yeah, it, it's going across very, very well. And that's obviously another quality that I've, I've developed. And it's... it's uh, the standards I, I put for myself, as I say, can be quite troublesome, but obviously it gives great, great rewards in the end. Simon, what three books have most influenced your thinking? Right, okay. I mean, as regards gun dogs, there's very few books actually written on gun dog training as such. And like with the vast majority of things I've done, I've done it through my own experience. Um, Yes, certain books, certainly with falconry, have influenced me. Um, the very first book I put, ever put on my shelf was Woodford's Manual of Falconry. Read cover to cover hundreds of times, pictures studied and all the rest of it, and a great beginner's book at its time. Um, lots of, um, well, there's two in particular, were, were Maverick Adato's Hawk for the Bush, but particularly Falcon in the Field. Falcon in the Field had a massive impact on me. It was, again, very, very early on, I was bought that as a Christmas present and, again, studied it. But it was the first book that I'd really read that was specific to one type of birds, i.e. falcons. Uh, within the book, there was a particular plate, a uh, colour plate um, of four geo falcon heads. And that, at the time, had a massive effect on me. And that's where my passion for geo falcons uh, began. Um, in those days, you never saw them. Uh, now they're readily available. Lots of people breeding them. They're everywhere. But in those days, you would struggle to find a photograph. Uh, to find anybody that was flying them, particularly in the UK, very never heard of at that time, very, very rare. Um, and to actually see a live one, it just never happened. But I got this fascination and I went on to study them in detail and I've, I've fulfilled my passion and I, I now fly pure geo falcons. Um, so yes, particularly falcon in the field, yes, had a massive, massive effect on me. Simon, what is your view of the way that both falcons and gun dogs are trained today? Right, it's like everything, things evolve um with methods and what is available to us as trainers to assist training but um let's look at the falconry side first um i'll come on to some other points later on regarding my views on the current state of falconry in the uk 
Um, but I think what is vitally important these days is, first of all, health and welfare. Um, that has to be paramount in today's sports. Same with the dogs. Uh, but health and welfare are the charges that we've got. Vitally important that that is maintained to an extremely high standard. Um, there seems to uh, falcon if we can just establish what actually falconry is falconry is the pursuit of wild game with trained hunting hawks falcons eagles or whatever with trained raptors it is a hunting sport and there seems to be this confusion uh between falconry true falconry and obviously bird keepers display keepers bird abatement and all the rest of it in my opinion the actual meaning of falconry must be maintained for the welfare of the sport, we must be seen to be carrying on what we're doing, okay? Um, as regards gun dogs, again, health and welfare, and I can see there being, a, I have concerns in a lot of ways with what I see now as gun dog trainers. As I've already said, back in my day, very, very few. Now you go on the internet, there is a million and one gun dog trainers out there um a lot of them have not got ex the experience or not proven themselves out there and i would say anybody who's looking to get into falconry or um uh, gun dog work or whatever yes there are people available to teach you but find the right people find people with a proven track record with qualifications in in field trials with gun dogs or or hunt regularly and are seen to be very good with the falcons and and, and learn from those people. But as regards to the gun dogs, I can see that evolving differently over the coming years, because whereas when I started, a working dog was a kennel dog, that was it. And now, and I was seeing this in the latter stages of my profession when I was doing it full time, was that they were coming more of a dual purpose dog, whereas they were coming more of a house dog, but as a pet, but also as a working dog. And two can work hand in hand, but I think trainers, particularly professional trainers, have to be more aware of this. So they guide the people in the right direction because it can work. We produce lots of dogs with clients that were both the pet and the working dog, but it has to work together. It can't be one or the other. And I think this is where it's going to go. Because again, the, the huge thing we're all aware of now is uh, gun dog thefts, well, dog thefts in general. So people are less reluctant to leave them in kennels now. So being a house dog, and it's going to evolve and be more um based around that one of the big concerns for me with dog training as well is that there seems to be this drift away from what dogs actually are and it's a canine it's a pack animal and you hear so much reference now that they are not pack animals well they still are they always will be that will never be bred out of them not in our lifetime and not for, for hundreds of years of domestication even though they've been domesticated for a long time they are still a pack animal and they have to be treated and the way i see it now a lot of people don't recognise that, and that's where the problems develop. And I think that must be by trainers of today, they have to be putting that across to their clients that they are still a pack animal. A related question, Simon. How do you see both true professional falconry in the field and gun dog training developing over the next 20 years? Right, okay. Um, Professional falconry in the field, as we've already said, it's it's the, the, in the true meaning, it's very, very rare. I don't know of one true professional, as in the case that I was, I'm, I'm believed to be the last one. Um, I think, as it's as it, like the, the people that do the displays, the falconry displays, if you're classing them as the, the falconers, then again, it, they need to be putting this across properly. Or anything related to field sports, country sports is under threat and so long as they maintain the standards and put it across in the correct way i'm hoping that falconry will still be here in 20 years time as for the gun dogs yet again um, as i've already touched on i think people need to maintain and understand the dog's behavior more they need to be more canine minded and be aware of what they're actually dealing with and, and a, a steer away from what I call a lot of these pet trainers that are creeping into the into the gun dog world. It's interesting what you say that you were potentially the last professional falconer in the field. What advice do you have for somebody wanting to go into those two sectors to be a professional falconer in the sense that you were and to be a 
a professional gun dog trainer? Yeah, again, if if the position would arise, then uh, and this this works for both aspects for the gun dogs or falconry, is to know to to thoroughly understand what you're dealing with, um, to have as much wider range as possible with gun dogs like I did myself, I didn't specialize just in one breed. I was known for cockers, but I have trained every working breed. I've trained pointers, setters, HPRs, all the spaniel breeds, retrievers, trained them to very high levels, competed with a lot of them. And it's having that full overall knowledge of those different breeds. Now, if you're going professional, you should then be able to deal with the issues that, that you experience with those dogs that are brought to you. Um, and again, when I started, for me, when I decided I was going to make a, a living out of training dogs or make it a, a business, back in the day, I went out and was just buying lots of dogs just to handle as many different breeds as I could and experience the problems to give you this wide experience. You can't be a professional at either of these sports by just successfully flying one bird or successfully handling one dog. You've got to do it with multiple charges before you can go professional and, and and be in a position to give um, advice, you've got to have a full range of experience on all the problems you're gonna come across, be it with falcons or hawks or whatever, or be it with dogs. It's getting as wide a range of experience as possible. Simon, what's the most treasured possession in your hawking bag? When you say, I read this with, with, with treasured, treasured possession or the most treasured item in my hawking equipment, and now, now I would say it's a piece of technology, and that is GPS, because the advent of GPS has enabled me to fly my falcons more freely, to give them more freedom and to fly them more naturally to how they would do. It. And it's helped me recognize mistakes that we made early on in the field. And I'll give you an instance. Um, I, I really enjoy flying the Falcons end of September, early October, warm days when you have thermals. And in days gone by, when a bird found a thermal and started to ride it high, it was always classed as going on the saw, which is not what anybody ever wanted because it would take them to great heights and often out of sight. And bear in mind, pre-telemetry days, that was disastrous. It was gone. You didn't know where it was. It often takes the bird out of sight. And what would happen is, as soon as a bird hit a, a thermal, everything and was said to be going on saw, everything was done to retain the bird. Lure out, call it back or whatever, or as soon as it was out of sight, off you went to track it. And in some cases, you track it back to where you started, but the penny never really dropped in the day. And But what would happen, because the bird had behaved like that, its condition was usually reduced to make it stay with you, which then had an impact on pitch and performance. But it must stay with you. With GPS, you now know where the bird is all the time and what it's doing, and you can allow them freedom. And, um, and what myself and a lot of other people have, have realized is that, yes, let them fly thermal, but more often than not, they're coming back. Give them time. With GPS, you know where they are. Even though they're not in eyesight, you can see them. You know exactly what they're doing. You know what it's doing, and you can see them, um, obviously, then tracking back. You give them time. You can give them 20 minutes, 25 minutes. More often than not, they come back at a super pitch. And you've got a super flight. So it's enabled us to allow the birds to fly freer and understand more what they're doing. Uh, and again, in the book, I go into detail. I've, I've gone on and, and worked with thermal flying. And I can actually, I actually train my birds to come off thermals when I want them. I, sometimes I don't want them at 2,000, 3,000 feet because the terrain doesn't dictate. But with my training methods, I let them ride a thermal and I can call them off it when they're 1,000 foot, 1,500 foot, if the the flush is going to be too close to cover from a greater pitch. So, yeah, modern day, in my current situation, my the GPS, because of the advantages it's had to falconry in general. Yes, it's a recovery aid, first and foremost, but it's particularly with falcons, it's enabled us to allow them to fly more naturally. So, yeah, very much treasured. Would never fly without it. That's great. Simon, what's your best bird of prey fact, please? I think is probably the eyesight of raptors. The key, I mean, it, they are eight times more powerful eyesight than ours. They say they can, I, I, I've not seen it up to this distance, but they often say they can see quarry up to three kilometers away. 
but for me, one of the best facts is with falcons is their third eyelid, which I think is fantastic. It's like a you can describe it as a motorbike helmet visor, a third eyelid that comes across to keep all the debris and tears and everything out the falcon's eyes as it's stooping. It can still see what it's doing, but obviously it's coming down at 100 plus mile an hour and it's got this built in third eyelid, which I think is just nature's way, just fantastic. Fantastic. And a similar question. What's your best gun dog or working dog fact, please? Um, I think the dog's ability to scent and you get the, what's been developed, like the different breeds you scent in different ways. And also being able to distinguish between what a foot scent, for instance, and a blood scent. And you can train a, a spaniel to hunt and flush game that is, is not wounded or whatever, and it'll flush game and it, and it will not follow it. But you can equally ask that dog then to track something wounded purely by its scent, like for an awful long way. The scenting ability of dogs, it, it's an enhanced uh, natural ability, like the, the, the sight of the, the raptors. The scenting ability of dogs is just phenomenal. And I've seen it in so many different instances. And you get the ground centers like your spaniels work on ground scent, you've got, and then you've got the air scenting breeds like pointers. And also being able to work different scents, different scenting conditions and all the rest. The pointers, the heads high, they work on air scent, scent that's carried by the wind and they can pick game up at phenomenal distances. Even when they're running at full speed across the wind, they can just spin on, on a sixpence and draw on for yards, well, 100, well, like 50, 60, 70, 80 yards or more on a line to the scent and then hold it. The, the, the scenting ability is phenomenal. What they think of our personal smell in that case, I have no idea and I don't want to know. <laughs> Simon, you've just published The Specialist Falcon. For any aspiring authors out there, What's involved, please, in getting the book written and published? Far more than I, <laughs> I first envisaged. My first publication, I've been um, harassed by many people to actually do this, and I think it's one of the good things, but for me, it's, it's the best thing that came out of lockdown last year. Um, first of all is to know your subject thoroughly. Um, not just get a slight interest or an insight. Know it thoroughly, because you are putting yourself out there. And you have to be able to, like I think I've done in the book, I, I justify all my comments and reasonings and all the rest of it through experience. So that's the first thing is obviously know your subject, know it very well, know it thoroughly. Um, the most important thing after that is have a very good team around you. Uh, writing the book was one thing, then putting it all into a completed uh, piece of work more than I ever expected. The writing for me ended up being the easy part. Then understanding, um, unfortunately through the contacts that I've built over the years, I was able to create a team from the, my, my contacts, uh, apart from the printers, but that came through recommendation, but having the right team to do the proofreading, the editing, and obviously the layout is vitally important. Um, having the right team around you to complete the work, that's what makes it what it is. And, and I also say go for as good a quality as you can. I think that makes a book, as you've seen, you've got the book yourself. And you're obviously you're aware you, you saw that, the, the special edition that we did. All of it, even the standard edition is very, very high quality. And I think that also makes a book. Quality photographs, and I think as, as well, uh, uh, again, going back to what you've seen, in, even in the standard edition, there's 230 photographs. Photographs speak hundreds of pages in just by looking at them. And if you if you can correspond it to the text with it, that helps people visualize. Um, it's all right writing. If you're a good writer, it's the book is only as good as the reader interprets what you've put down. But if you add the right pictures and lots of pictures, and I know going back to a child with my falconry books, if you look at the old ones on the shelf now, I know where all my favorite pictures are because the thump, the corners are all thump, but pictures mean an awful lot. And, uh, and even today now, people are loving the amount of pictures that we've put in this, in this publication. Uh, so it's important, but the key thing is have a good team around you. Is there anything else, Simon, that you'd like to add? Um, one of my, my great things at the moment, as, as I hope people have recognized, I mean, I, 
falconry is a lifestyle for me. It has been since I was eight years old. I live and breathe it. I've done it as a career. It's led me on to other careers, but I'm always back to falconry. Falconry is what I live and breathe for. Um, it's even out of season now. It still occupies most waking hours and there's always something to do related to it, but it's my life. Um, my biggest concerns is for the longevity of the sport, um, as we've already touched on earlier on. Sadly, in the UK, I see that we are unregulated. And that to me is a great worry uh, because of uh, the free availability that anybody with any amount of money You've got the money, you could go out tomorrow and buy a golden eagle. You could go and buy a white gear falcon, not knowing what you're doing or whatever. And it's quite frightening what we see on social media of lost birds and this, that and the other. And I think we need a tightening of regulations or some sort of regulations bringing in to govern the sport for the longevity of it. Um, I have made moves with some of the, uh, with the, with the British Falconers Club and one or two others to try and get things moving in the right direction, bringing in mentoring schemes and all the rest, because there's a, there's a, a, a massive interest in falconry and bird of prey keeping. There is a difference. But first and foremost, as I started off with, it's health and welfare of the birds, and this must be maintained. And at the moment, it concerns me that we are not regulated. So I do feel that for the sport, and I want to see it going on, I want to see it for the next generation and the generation after that. I could sit back and fly birds for the rest of my days and probably it will still be legal, but it's, I worry about the next generation. I want falconry to continue and I will do everything in my powers to, to help it along the way. Um, but something does need to be done. And I just hope that uh, the people who are, sh who are shouting the loudest about it at the moment are heard by the right people. Simon Tyers author of The Specialist Falcon, professional falconer and gun dog trainer. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. My pleasure, John. My pleasure. That's the Practical Animal Channel interview. Thanks for watching.